I used to be a successful person until I was about 13 years old. You might wonder how I knew that. Well, people told me all the time. Friends, parents, teachers, you name it. Something they were particularly impressed with was my math skills, calling me a math talent. This was nothing less than expected since dad's an engineer and mom a math teacher. I had probably inherited their combined math genes. Because genes predict our lives. Or so I thought. In school, I was praised for getting mathematics. The less effort I put into solving a task, the better. I also learned that my ability of smoothly solving the tasks I was given would later be assessed and rated, and the grades would be crucial for my future. My dream was to become a doctor. My successful life went on until I one day did a math test on which I got a C. This was neither the best nor the second best grade, but the third best, or worst from my point of view. I was devastated and got this big lump in my belly, which all of you that have ever failed probably can relate to. I had run out of talent. My devastation turned into anger. I was angry with the Swedish school system, being old-fashioned and stupid, forcing students to do the math. How many of you have ever used quadratic equations in your everyday lives? Have you ever seen a doctor trying to solve X in order to figure out how to cure your headache? Math was useless and now stood in the way of my dream of becoming a doctor. I was sad and got my first panic attack. I called mom and I begged her to call me in sick. After a long argument, she went along and picked me up from school. When I got home, the lump in my belly had grown even bigger. Now I had realized it would eventually become apparent to everyone that I couldn't cope with math anymore. My solution was to make a plan on how to avoid the remaining math lessons that semester. My talent had taken me to the eighth grade, but was now depleted. The sooner I accepted this fact, the better I could cover it up and continue to appear successful. Still a bit shaken from my failure, I got to school the next day, nervous about the upcoming math lesson. It didn't exactly get any better when my math teacher asked to talk to me. It turned out I had missed an opportunity to join a new math project when I had fled school the previous day. The name of the project was Mativation, and my teacher had taken the liberty of enrolling me to this 200-hour math course. Again, I felt panic just rise in my body. However, I went to the first motivation workshop thinking that I couldn't be the absolute worst. The workshop started with the mentor drawing a big circle on the whiteboard, asking us to solve the area. I was puzzled. We didn't have any figures or formula, and the drawing didn't even look like a proper circle. I was confused, but he kept pushing us to figure out new ideas of how to solve the problem, without giving us any useful clues. After a while, we found a way 
of proving the formula, and I was thrilled. He then looked at all of us, and instead of praising us, he gave us another impossible task. After the workshop, I went to my football training. That evening, we did a fitness workout, and I wasn't too thrilled. But I never questioned the use of this training session the same way I questioned math when it got hard. But why? I mean, would I ever actually use the push-ups we did on the training in a game situation? Of course not, but I understood that, that the push-ups would be indirectly beneficial since the exercise would make me stronger and the strength would help me become a better football player. What I learned through motivation was that the same applies to mathematics. The majority of us won't have a great direct use of it, but we will gain the ability to analyze, seeing patterns and drawing conclusions through math. Math is fitness training for the brain. It's the indirect use that matters, especially for a doctor who needs to be able to quickly analyze observations and test results in order to give a diagnosis. But how do we get smarter? Let's start with looking at how we get stronger. Many would claim that going to the gym makes you stronger. I would say it kind of depends on what you're doing at the gym. I'm not sure about how much bicep training you get from taking selfies, for example. But let's say you're actually lifting weights. That should make you stronger, right? Right? So I thought I might do a small gym session right here. So here's my weight. Are you ready? One, two, three. Will I get stronger? Of course not, it's too easy. I need to practice with something heavier, something challenging. Push-ups, for example. If I can do 10, I would need to do 11 or even 12 in order to develop my strength. The last two are so hard and people are in great risk of giving up. So they even pay personal trainers to scream at them so they won't stop. Same thing with getting smarter. Do we develop our brain by just doing math? Do good grades necessarily mean that we are using math for its main purpose, to get smarter and develop our way of thinking? Unfortunately, no. As I said in the beginning of my speech, I was praised for getting mathematics. And that also got me good grades. But doing tasks you get is equal to lifting weights that aren't challenging. It won't give you great or any development at all. In order to develop, you need to do tasks you don't get. And when you eventually do get it, you should move on to another task that you don't get, because that's how you develop. So math isn't about getting the equations you're doing, but about not getting them without giving up. I continued attending the motivation workshops, and not before long, I became the mentor to other students about my age. We traveled around Sweden and held math lessons all over the country, which I really enjoyed. One day, I was giving a math lesson to sixth graders here in Gothenburg. I arrived confident, had a nice plan for the 70-minute long lesson. It turned out a disaster. No one was paying any attention to me, and the lack of interest became obvious when curtains and chairs were literally flying through the classroom. When I thought we had done almost the whole lesson, I gazed at my watch. Eleven minutes had passed. I was exhausted and I had failed. 
This time, unlike my previous failure, it never crossed my mind that I had run out of mentor talent. I just needed to find other ways of solving the problem. My mindset had changed through motivation. It was about not getting it. A group of professionals that are experts on not getting it is engineers. They count challenging math throughout their whole education in order to become good at solving problems. When they eventually start working, the use of the equations they did in school won't be as important as the skills they have developed while getting challenged without giving up. In fact, engineers get paid for not getting it, and that is also what they're trained for through math. The thing is, most students applying to engineering programs have quite good grades, but the dropout rate is high. The students aren't used to challenges and don't believe in their own ability to, fa to face failure. Motivation mentors from 8th and 9th grade have held lectures to first-year students at Chalmers University of Technology here in Gothenburg about the importance of failing and not getting it. But engineers aren't the only ones who benefit from motivation. We all need our brains to be in best shape possible, and therefore we should all do more things we don't get. Since I started with motivation, I have traveled around Sweden and Norway to pass my experience forward. By motivating, involving, and challenging students in mathematics, I have given them the possibility to learn by teaching other students. To teach is to learn twice, as Joseph Jobur once said. And this is what we use in motivation. When students start teaching, they become actors and valuable resources. This approach is not only applicable to the school system. Teaching others and learning from each other is beneficial for society as a whole. This is nothing new, but our society doesn't utilize the resources and knowledge available within the organization, chasing the next big thing, like you are today. But when it comes to math, we have all heard that the main problem is lack of interest in it. Motivation has a big network of students just like me. In 2018, my colleagues and I met more than 16,000 students and teachers in Sweden, Norway and the Philippines. We are active in over 13 cities, and throughout the years, we have met more than 200,000 students and teachers. A couple of weeks ago, I was in a school in Malmö, offering 8th graders to enroll to a 30-hour not-getting-it course. 65% of the 8th graders wanted to join. Does that sound like a lack of interest to you? In this modern world, one might think that we need a bunch of digital tools to get the students interested and involved with mathematics. But the only tools motivation uses when teaching students hungry to learn by teaching other students is pen and paper. That as well strongly contradicts the common idea that there is a lack of interest in math. The interest is rather too high. Most of you haven't heard about this program, and yet we cannot handle more interested students. We are trying to keep a low profile in order to not create chaos. And that is why I'm talking to you guys. You are the ones who can actually make a change. So keep this to yourselves, and don't mention it to anyone.
Because if you do, we'd end up with a bunch of people hungry to learn while spreading their knowledge, and that might change the whole society. Thank you. Thank you.